look at me like hello and welcome to the Mutz and Mischief coffee hour and tonight it's me and Laura Nichols talking about uh, mental health and how we can help in the dog training industry and dog guardians and sharing our own experiences. So, Laura, did you want to start with a little bit of background about yourself? Um, okay, so with mental health, I'm going to be quite open and say that I got involved in sort of mental health services for myself um, when I was a young teenager. Um, and that's something that's never really left me. Um, and then I started working in the care, health and social care field um, when I left college. And that was something that carried on. And I almost, at the time, I think I almost felt like it helped my mental health um but probably wasn't the most healthy way of dealing with things because I was basically just getting um very what's the word well I ended up um working my way up the ladder and then I ended up with burnout and I just I just couldn't do it anymore because I just felt um that I was I tried so hard to change things in the care industry and nothing was happening and I had compassion fatigue all the time and I just burnt out completely and thought you know I can't do this anymore um and then since then I've sort of tried to invest a lot more in myself about my own mental health and tried to create boundaries and look after myself more um however with, with animals i'm still working on it because i find um in some ways i find working with animals sometimes is more difficult like because i can't create certain bound i can't like shut off from it i don't know how to explain it but i'm I think you probably understand what I mean, Tasha. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I have like a few, you know, helpful things that I use um, now, but, but yeah. It's hard, isn't it? And like you said, with uh, working with dogs and animals, it's a completely different kind of burnout. In fact, the compassion fatigue, isn't it, compared to. Mm -hmm working with humans and the difference is like in a care setting you've got a team so you can speak to colleagues you've got a manager you can speak to and then obviously you can refer out to CQC safeguarding GPs and then there's like a whole team that you can work with across the board and then in dog training you're totally alone <laughs> it's yeah. just like tumbleweed isn't it um because obviously we do make friends and stuff, but it can be difficult, can't it? Because of competitive behaviours from other professionals or people unwilling to change their stance and their beliefs. And then you automatically get drawn into this war that you didn't agree to be a part of, like with the balance versus the force free. And suddenly you're getting fake reviews from balance trainers and local competition and it's just oh really pathetic isn't it really because yeah at the end of the day we're in it to help the dogs and sadly for such a nice species of animal I mean all animals are wonderful but for dogs and like that the way they are their characteristics they're so forgiving and they're so sweet and just really nice they attract the most toxic awful people because many people are super toxic and are super awful in both camps. That's not just like, oh, it's only balance trainers. It's absolutely force free as well. Mm -hmm. It's all the time. Um, like Sally Gutteridge, who's authored lots of books, obviously owns Canine Principles and ISCP. We love Sally. Uh, yeah. She shared a post this week, didn't she, about toxic 
toxic behaviors in the forestry community yes I, I saw some of the posts yeah that she'd posted previously and I I felt like I'd completely understood where she was coming from in her posts and then some of the comments from other force free people were just I was like what I, I think they hadn't really bothered to actually think about it yeah and that's really common across yeah, yeah. that's super got have a don't read it don't read the infographic don't watch the video and then make an uninformed stupid response that's toxic on an yeah. anti-toxic post like <laughs> Honestly, the industry's got to change. So we're going to be talking about professionals and obviously guardians, but for the professionals, because there's so many people that are feeling burnt out at the moment or compassion fatigue, because like you said, you invest yourself in it so much and you really care. And then you just find yourself anxious and then you're stressing and you're losing sleep, which obviously it all negatively affects mental health, whether you've got mental health problems or not um so for like myself i'm very much like you where my problems were i think well i've always had depression and anxiety but i think once i was a teenager and able to access medical services myself when i ran away from home it was like oh you've got anxiety and depression it was like wait whoa guess what i already knew that well done <laughs> <laughs> and then it just spiraled from there so suddenly it was gone from not being able to access medical services to boom, here's a diagnosis and here's another diagnosis and here's another diagnosis and here's another one. And it was just so overwhelming. And if I knew back then what I knew now, like refusing to do certain tests and things because of a negativity, I definitely wouldn't have refused back then. But for a teenager who's in care and has like, no positive support system like we see now so literally 15 years on we're pro autism uh you know acceptance and then we're pro talking about depression and mental health in some circles and like the whole stance has changed but back then it was oh so you've got depression and anxiety so if you need to leave classes that's okay so already you're ostracized and you're different to all the other students. You got dyslexia too, kid. <laughs> and you got dyspraxia. Oh, and here's dyscalculia as well. So you're gonna need a special needs tutor. So again, ostracized from my peers at college before I've even begun. And instantly it shifts and it changes. And people don't wanna like be around you because your special needs because that was the term back then whether yeah. you use it or not the term back then was special needs and he was ostracized and then here's a side of counseling as well but you have to leave your lessons to go to counseling so everyone's going to know about it way to go yeah. kid and like that's carried on a lot and then in the dog training industry it's very much the same so some people talk about mental health but not a lot. And then some people want to silence you if you talk about mental health just because it doesn't affect them. And it's like, your clients are gonna struggle with mental health. So coming around to the guardians, you can't just shut professionals up who wanna talk about mental health because that's not okay because guardians will have mental health problems or your guardians may be autistic or your guardians may have learning needs and they may need to be taught something repetitively and then something else that annoys me is when you see posts that say i had to tell this guardian five times in a row and they still didn't get it so you just basically picked on somebody for having a learning disability that they may or may not know about depending on their age group because we know like obviously our age group the difficulties that we had with getting diagnosed and supported so for 40 year olds upwards, it's gonna be even harder for them to get a diagnosis. And then you've got professionals taking the piss out of them on social media. So it just doesn't make any sense, does it? It's, yeah. it drives me mad. Oh. I know that, yeah, that 
well a few months ago yeah there was a balance trainer in the UK who called out one of his clients about her mental health that she had disclosed as well which yeah really annoys me I don't do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah, the guy who launched a French bulldog off the sofa after yeah. lowering it up there with treats and then letting the dog take the treats and then throw it off the sofa. Yeah. Oh, shock, and there was a shock collar involved. But, um, yeah. yeah, like, I feel like throughout my life in any industry, that's what people have always done is as soon as like you speak out or say something they use your mental health against you absolutely that's the only thing they have yeah exactly because they can't pick on your work they can't pick on your style of work your standard of work so let's get them what they see as a weakness which is mental health and then they'll just keep going at it so that's when the negative comments come up the fake reviews, getting their mates then to do fake reviews and all the rest of it. And then the nasty spiral that starts on Facebook with untruths and stuff. And then you don't see this person defending themselves because they're probably in a ball curled up somewhere, absolutely terrified mm -hmm. to go on social media and haven't got the strength to deal, deal with it at all because... Obviously, there's so many disorders and conditions that come with mental health. You don't know what somebody's going through. And it's like the Be Kind movement with that uh, actress who uh, lost her life. It was... I can't remember her name. Was it, the, was it the Love Island host? I think I so. Think... I think so. I know she had a dog that she really just bad. died recently. <laughs> Yeah, but I can honestly say I had no idea who she was before that event. I think it was because, yeah, she was like slated in the so yeah social media for so many things. And she just, yeah, she just couldn't cope in the end. And that's yeah. why she ended her life. I'm sure a lot of people, I know anyone tipping my tongue. I just can't remember it right now. Yeah. Um, but I honestly had no idea who this person was because I don't watch reality TV. So I didn't know who she was. I just remember that. Unfortunately, she lost her life because of bullying on social media. And apparently she was going through a court case with her ex. Yeah, that sort of yeah. yeah. However, then, they still carried on doing the TV show as well, which I have watched some of. And it's really bad, like, wow. which I, I don't agree with at all. Like the stuff that producers make them do. And then when they come to the outside world, they get all this negativity and they're like, oh, my God, like, I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And no support afterwards. And it's like, did you not learn from before? Like, I don't think they should be allowed to do these programmes if they're not going to offer the support. But I know that's a whole different matter together. No, no, I totally agree, because it all comes back to the same thing. And media, again, pours poison into the dog training industry. Media's horrendous for it. So, no, no, I totally agree. And after that poor lady lost her life, then it was the Be Kind movement with the most toxic people using that logo. And it's like, just because you had a temporary profile... In the first place. Exactly. Just because you had a temporary profile picture does not mean that you're a nice person because we've seen the rest of your posts all the rest of the years and you're horrible. And yeah. it just makes a joke of it. So, like the mental health community amongst all our different communities because we're such a broad spectrum we adopted the be kind movement and we adopted lots of different terms that then people without any problems take on and then use it to flaunt again their ego mm. which again is just really toxic so we're stuck in this forever toxic cycle of egos and it's just yeah awful awful and again like for me it makes no sense because dogs are so loving and dogs are these amazing creatures yet these horrible horrible people are around them and like when I shared our podcast and this guy clearly had a bee in his bonnet that he had to get out of his system and he commented on entirely the wrong post because he didn't comment on the correct post because our podcast didn't say 
anything about being kind to dogs, did it? <laughs> and about how he disagrees and how he's awful to his bulldog because she doesn't listen, blah, blah, blah. We don't care. <laughs> we, like, if someone shares a nice, like, this is what dogs need are above their biological needs. So be kind to them, give treats, like, stop being so military with your dogs. Like, you're not trying to, you may be trying to prove something to yourself, but you're certainly not to your dog or the rest of the community. Like, that's your baggage to sort out. If you've got to take that on a dog, that's really, really sad. And that's for you to sort out. And it comes back down to Sally again, doesn't it? Like, Sally's been sharing similar things and getting the negative mm -hmm. rubbish on it. And it gets to a point where you're like, do I even respond because they don't want to change their ways? They're clearly doing it to get a reaction. So do we start ignoring these people entirely? Not saying that we don't disagree with what they've said, not that it, you know, hasn't caused a reaction, but do we stop giving a reaction where they're getting responses back the same way that teachers used to say we're bullying at school like don't mm. respond to it sort of thing and they'll get bored because you do see that quite a lot on social media where they do eventually give up and get bored don't they yeah I think the more you respond they do yeah they just they just carry on but sometimes it's very hard to not respond and say something because you know you your heart's in it so yeah I like I said to you earlier like I try to I try my best to ignore comments like that because I know I'm not gonna have a kind response to them so yeah I mean this is it isn't it because it does hurt us and I think that's what it's exactly designed to do when you claim that you're force free and you show it so you walk the walk you don't just talk the talk and you never show any evidence for this and then when you're putting up a holistic post as well you basically put a target on your back saying bully me because people mm. aren't ready to accept it and I recently spoke to Colin Spence about this as well and he said like the way that I speak to him and the way that I talk about dog training and behavior modification, he said, it's like, you're just out there, like in the future and the rest of us haven't caught up yet. And that's kind of an isolating place to be because it's great that I may have all these new methodologies and stuff like continuous reinforcement. And there is no sort of methodology explanation behind this yet because the world's not ready for it. But at the same time, being built that way, everything hurts a lot more. So like being an empath and empathetic with animals, that comment isn't just a throw the cuff off, I'm going to annoy the force free community. It's you are verbally abusing your dog because you've got issues like that's not OK. Mm. And then it upsets us because we're thinking, well, this individual dog is having a really hard time because their human clearly has ego problems that they're taking out of their dog. Um, and like when you look at parenting styles as well, so with awful parents, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you look at the different styles and it's like authoritarian, um, authoritative, entangled um and then the absent parent like being authoritative there's nothing wrong with that because you want to keep your dog safe but at the same time you're not being a douche to them yeah like is you well you need to go on a lead even though we don't really like it because you could get hit by a car mm. or you need to go on a lead because it's not safe because other entitled people think that having their dog off a lead who's going to attack you is completely fine so it's being sensible and using common sense when you're using an authoritarian person it's like military they've got baggage that they need to sort out but they will take it out on their own children or the dog and they're controlling food like treats they're controlling meals they're controlling toys um these people that keep their dogs in crates and their dogs can't do anything without permission it's just 
absolutely ridiculous. So there's no expression of natural needs. So they're actually breaking the law. And I'm so tired of telling people that you're breaking the law because the Animal Welfare Act is there for a reason and the five freedoms are there for a reason. And so many people are breaking the law with not following the five freedoms and thinking they can just do what they want because there are so little prosecutions, which is obviously why I wrote to the Prime Minister about it. Yeah. And then on the other scale, you've got other owners who like entangled and absent who just don't care or they may care deep down but then they don't because like it's not again it's a different scale it's not meeting the needs of the dogs it's not being bothered with the dogs it's being too engrossed in your own life like being on your phone and stuff or going out all the time to bother about what the dog's doing or the level of separation anxiety and how bad things have got or taking them for a walk and being on your phone and the dog's two miles ahead of them yeah, yeah, yeah that, was, that winds me up, yeah. Yeah, I exactly. Actually, um, I don't know about you, but if I'm in the house and I'm on my phone too long, then Luna will sh shove it out of my hand and it flies across the room and I'm like, oops, sorry. <laughs> my dogs do that. Yeah. When, when they want attention. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm, like, I'm sorry, like, I didn't realise I just got lost in my phone like and yeah she's so right you know exactly exactly yeah. you nobody should punish a dog for that behavior it's a case of i need your attention i'm connection seeking with you right now so you know make a connection with me i'm here and mm. that's the thing isn't it we don't get dogs to be ornaments you know they are like having two to five year old children running about the house and they need to have our attention and they need us to do things with them and interact with them not just have them as an ornament and then you know take them out when we feel like it and then do dog sports with them because of our ego because dance mums and all that jazz you know and then for normal guardians guardians who just got a dog because they want somebody to love they they you know they want a dog because it meets their needs and whatever and then I think that these are the guys that are particularly struggling the ones who are feeling suffocated because yeah hands up I think sometimes posts like mine can be maybe suffocating if taken the wrong way and we all know how Facebook posts and comments can be taken the wrong way especially when you're not in a great place of mental health so if you're seeing like posts like mine that's had like, I don't know, 46 shares or something about what dogs need beyond five freedoms. And it's saying all this stuff about uh, being present and giving them treats and being, a, you know, a holistic base. For an owner who already feels like they're failing, who may be going through the puppy blues, or they may already be struggling if they've adopted a dog, for example, then that post could unintentionally like be suffocating to them and I think these are the guys that really need the help and they're always the ones who come to the big groups for advice like do no harm and apologize they mm. begin their process it's like friend <laughs> <laughs> because we apologize don't we yeah all the time all the time because it's just one of those quirks that comes along with mental health so it's sorry to bother you or sorry you know and feeling like you're encroaching on people's space straight away or feeling like you're burdening somebody else and it's like they are my people because they're the ones who are truly struggling they're not just posting time and time again because they just want to keep posting it. it's a case of they very rarely post but when they do it's desperate mm. And I think it takes a lot of courage for them to do that. And I think, yeah, if there is anyone listen, any dog owners that listen to this, um, like just know that when we're posting stuff on social media as well, I think I'm especially guilty of it is that I always post good stuff. I never post negative stuff because I'm always afraid of backlash because of my own mental health and then I think dog owners see that and then they see like oh that's the expectation that's what my dog should be like 
Um, yeah, and I don't want other dog owners to feel like that. Um, so, yeah, and it is, like you said, when you said about the puppy blues, it is very normal to have, like, your down days and feeling like you're not good enough. But the reason you're feeling like that is because you care about your dog. Exactly. If you didn't feel like that, then it means you probably don't care. Yeah. Um, but I do believe, yeah, if people are constantly feeling guilty that they're not good enough for their dog or that they've done something wrong, then it is because they care. Because I constantly feel like that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I think most of us do who do genuinely care. And it's like, it's funny you should say about the photos, because to me, um, you know, that expression, a photo uh, says a hundred words or whatever the expression is. Yeah. To me, it's a photo expresses 100 lies. Yeah. So if you are listening and you're a dog owner and you're sick of seeing these wonderful photos, a photo is 0 0.03 seconds of a snapshot. And then it'll be cleverly edited anyway. So when people put up these photos, don't fall for it because we've all been there and learned the hard way, especially myself, and photos are a lie. And there is a reason that there is a photo of 0 0.03 seconds instead of a video. Because if you saw the video, you feel more like, oh, actually, everyone's going through this and it's not just me. You'd feel so much better. Um, and it, you know, trying, it's got to stop. We've got to be more transparent. And this is holding dog professionals accountable as well. Like we've got to be more transparent, like with our wordings and the mm. videos that we do share and photos and making out everything's hunky dory all the time. It's just a complete lie. I mean, you look at some people on social media and you're like, wow, they really got their lives together. Like I'm failing. And then you mm. speak to them in person, and you're like, you lie all yeah. the time. Like you've ruined my life all <laughs> these years because you're a liar. <laughs> oh. I would love, I'd love to share more like, you know, dog training gone wrong stories on social media, but I just don't think I'm so scared if I do that, then I'll get negative backlash from whoever and I just don't think I can cope with that so yeah it is really hard I think to be think brave enough to do that yeah it's sad is it I think we need to normalize it because now I've got to the point where I don't care anymore so like the other day I showed zombies video and I even put in red letters it's gone wrong <laughs> exactly because people need to see because people have a tendency to put me on a pedestal especially clients and I had this a lot before COVID as well with the in-person it was it's all right for you to say this because when a client is well winning humans we'll ditch work client for tonight when a person is down then they'll compare themselves straight away so all I was getting which was negatively impacting me was it's all right for you your dog's perfect what no they're not where are you looking <laughs> and I've always put videos up like I've got nearly a decade's worth of videos on YouTube I always put videos up they are not perfect not by a long stretch they are dogs they're not perfect but people would put this onus onto it and then detach themselves from me trying to be comforting in saying it's all right for you your dog's perfect and I, I would turn around with yeah it's all right for me because all I do when I finished with you guys and then, uh, you know, in classes is go home and train my dogs. And mm. first thing in the morning is training my dogs. And that's what people didn't see. They think the dogs are just magically trained and we do this job because we're magic. What they don't see is all the hard work that goes into it, you know. And then uh, conversely, you have some dog trainers who do absolutely no training at all, but then don't share anything about their dogs either. Or they'll just share photos. Mm. It's much like when you do a job as a professional job and then when you come home, you don't want to be associated with that job. Like I knew a cleaner once who did a really, really good job at the workplace, went to a flat and I was like gobsmacked because it was horrific. 
never seen anything like it because she was not cleaning at home <laughs> and you could tell like it really shocked me but at the same time it was like wow people really do take it's literally like I am not taking my work home with me mm. like wow just yeah I just couldn't believe it but for dog owners out there who do look at dog training stuff because I know you like to be friends with us and that's not a problem but just be mindful if you're constantly seeing photos or short videos there is a reason for it and yes I am spilling trade secrets because we need to for mental health and it's okay saying on your website or your Facebook page I'm all about transparency with 100 Instagram filters because it's not okay to share that if you're not being genuine because clients need uh, genuine responses from us because again like the lady you mentioned earlier with the French bulldog with the bad trainer mm. if if she had seen transparency maybe she wouldn't have made the same decision and a lot of people that I've spoken with who have come from balanced trainers have said I didn't feel like I could leave because going yeah. back to the parenting very authoritarian attitude and ego making the dog owner feel really small and helpless and pathetic because what they do just like a bad parent a narcissistic parent or you know an abusive parent is straight away they will say disabling words so straight away they'll knock your confidence they'll make sure that you know that they think that you're weak and pathetic and yeah they literally do I'm not just saying this for dramatic effect that's literally what they do, some of the things that I've heard have been absolutely traumatizing. And it's no wonder that that person stayed with that balance trainer. And it's no wonder it also took them a long time to wait before coming to myself because, yeah, I'd be totally put off dog training professionals as well if I've been spoken to the way that a lot of these people have. And yeah. again, with so called force free trainers. It's okay calling yourself force free, but if you're not force free, you shouldn't have that label. And even like going over and edging over to the lemur bit, I don't think a lot of people are getting it and understanding what lemur actually means. It means least intrusive, minimally aversive. It doesn't mean, but I'll be balanced if I want a quicker result. Mm. And that's what a lot of people aren't getting from this, because if you look at Grisha Stewart, entirely force free but claims to be lima so oh, i think i didn't know that yeah literally like grisha stewart is entirely force free and i've watched hours upon hours and hours of her materials over the years and i can't honestly say that i've seen her do anything that's aversive or recommend anything aversive even in extreme cases so grisha is very transparent mm. to the point where she shows case studies all the time in video with dog guardians, but is also labelled herself as Lima. So it's got to change. The, the, the whole lot of it has got to change. And saying you're force free to pull in dog owners to make quick cash, because you know that's a label many dog owners will gravitate to. Shame on you. Not shame on the dog owner, shame on you. Yeah. That's really bad because you're lying and you're the equivalent of a cowboy builder who's detrimentally going to affect the mental health and the physical health of a dog because you want to make some quick cash. And, and you've seen that as well, haven't you, Laura? So it's not just like me going. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've had like, you know, personal experience and experience with, you know, other people and I've seen how mentally they've been affected um from balance trainers and recently I've seen like posts from someone that had an issue like over a year ago um and is still recovering from the trauma of what they were put through with that balance trainer and it just uh, goes to show that it doesn't leave you like that yeah. guilt like I know this person feels 
guilty and responsible and yeah I've often although I've never used diversives like I've often felt guilty and responsible at times for my dog's like welfare and everything because I'm constantly judging myself but well four three people have bullied you like mm-hmm. on social media four three people have bullied you and made you feel inadequate or felt like you had to hide Luna's story oh okay yeah yeah that's happened too yeah so um yeah that's very much made me feel like yeah Luna shouldn't be an assistance dog because she's a rescue she's an ex-street dog um and this kind of thing so she's not she's not bred for it she's not bred by a reptile breeder and she hasn't got certain traits and that kind of thing um so yeah I have been really scared of posting on social media about it um and then yeah I did make my first post on Instagram of her wearing an assistance dog jacket um it was a couple of weeks ago wasn't it um yeah and I was really nervous about it because I thought I'll probably get like unfollowed by lots of people now (laughs) that's really sad yeah like because that's not left me since you told me that that's not left me that people have been that way with you about it because like again with total transparency with the um owner trained assistance dogs none of them are bred for it (laughs) If we're being totally honest, a breeder doesn't give somebody a puppy on the premise that the dog's going to be an assistance dog. Yeah. So these dogs aren't bred for it. Their parents aren't assistance dogs. Their grandparents aren't assistance dogs. Mm. So it's just ridiculous that people will put this label onto it. Yeah. Um, uh, Yeah. And it's like with... uh, guide dogs and whatever like even some of the dogs that they bring in won't have a history of being a guide dog because of inbreeding so they can't just keep breeding guide dogs non-stop because a it's unethical b inbreeding which you know a lot of people are going to be aware of that so they're going to have to bring in dogs that have got no history of assistance dogs or Mm. their grandparents or parents or great-grandparents and there's this snobbery, which is just stupid. Uh, and I've seen people be bullied all the time because their assistance dog's a Yorkshire Terrier um, or their assistance dog is a Bull Mastiff or their assistance dog is a German Shepherd. Who cares? It's none of your damn business. Yeah. If the team can do the work and that person feels better because their dog is helping them mind your own damn business because it's got to stop do you ever get it with having wolf dogs no not once nobody has ever given me grief now i don't know if they don't dare (laughs) or what it is but no genuinely i've never had grief for having uh, assistance dogs that are wolf dogs or diesel but you know what i have had grief over being disabled so do you remember that post of Pulper taking the dogs out and it was the first time due to my crappy living circumstance? On yes, YouTube, so on the long lines. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, that's it. And on YouTube, somebody went, because I always like doing instruction, don't I? Or share some words mm-hmm. of wisdom. Somebody felt the need to go on my YouTube who hasn't subscribed, doesn't interact with my videos, but they obviously just stalk disabled people all day long because they're a pathetic loser. Uh, and they put in... Good for you, but all I give a crap about is if you can pick your dog's poo up just because you're disabled doesn't exempt you. <laughs> and I was just like, I block. Because you don't deserve a response. You are uh, literally the definition in the dictionary of a troll. Go away. Um, so I can be quite, you know, confident and laugh about it now. But at the time, it was really scary and upsetting that somebody is literally sitting there to bully disabled people like British people as a nation and I know Americans as well are very much anti-Nazi 
Mm. Yet, why are disabled people constantly being bullied mm. when that's what the Nazis did? Um, like last night and a couple of months ago, I've uh, seen two women on TikTok that are disabled and then been pregnant. People are saying, abort it. Disabled people shouldn't be allowed to breed like disabled people are animals. And the sick comments that are made towards disabled people is just absolutely vile and absolutely disgusting. And again, disabled people are another minority that hide away, don't enlist dog trainers because they've had a crappy experience with a so-called forestry dog trainer. And I'm saying this because the disabled people that I work with have all had forestry trainers, not balanced trainers, who have said horrible things to them or left them out on purpose because they don't know how to work with a disabled person, which I think is disgusting. Yeah, I think I actually, I, I saw a post and I can't remember, what, it was a question on a group on Facebook a while ago and it was a force free group and a dog trainer was asking how to work with a disabled person. And I was, yeah, I was kind of reading it and I was like, how did I respond to this? I don't even know. Like, I was just gobsmacked by the actual question. <laughs> it's just, it's disgusting. It really is. And the thing is, don't ask how you can work with a disabled person. Refer to a disabled dog trainer and behaviourist. Because there's plenty of us out there and you're literally taking work from disabled people, from a minority group who can emphasise and live that life every day. Um, nothing annoys me more than people pretending to use wheelchairs and stuff with disabled clients because you have no idea how hard it is being in a wheelchair because you can get up at any point. You can go to the toilet. You can get up and walk. You don't have to deal with potholes you got no idea what it's like being in debilitating pain. And I find it mocking that they work with these people and they'll do it for like 20 minutes or whatever in a wheelchair that they've managed to get hold of. And I find it just, yeah, like the words are gone. It's, it's just taking the mick and it is mocking and it's degrading as well because... These people are going to be nice and they're going to be polite and they're going to not respond or voice their opinions. And they may even feel that they cannot access a disabled trainer because mm. disabled trainers are shouted down all of the time. And then recently as well, in literally the past the two weeks, um, I'm not saying the Facebook group name, but... Uh, one Facebook group that I'm in, which I expected a lot better and is heavily moderated. Somebody said um, like that they needed help with a disabled client because the dog's doing X, Y, Z and they're not sure about it. And then this person piped up with disabled people shouldn't have dogs because they've got no mobility and they can't help the dogs, can't do anything with them. They're just relying on other people. And I genuinely wanted to hurt this person so badly because of that condescending attitude and also not referring to disabled people as disabled pe person, but immobile. Mm. And I was just like, yeah. you, my friend, are a piece of crap. And they hid their name as well because they did it under a so-called dog training page. So you didn't actually know who the person was. Because, of course, I had looked into it and investigated because I was yeah. like, I'm going to kill you when I find out who you are. <laughs> because it's disgusting. And it's disgusting having that attitude that disabled people shouldn't be allowed dogs. Who the hell are they? Yeah. And wow, I'm really surprised I haven't seen that. I'm really angry about it. And then, again, in another group, um, it was that the, basically there's a disabled person and the carer takes the puppy to the puppy class once a week but apparently the pup's peeing all over the house but they won't go out to the house because it's too far away and then said that this person is immobile so I was like right hang on a minute you won't go to the house 
the person's immobile yet has a carer only once a week and then isn't that actually at the house goes to a puppy class <laughs> so go get a brain cell get out of the dog training industry immediately Ugh. and i made several referrals to lots of other people who wouldn't be ableist and mm-hmm. make derogatory comments and will communicate with the dog guardian themselves rather than making loads of ableist assumptions. And it makes me really, really angry. So for any disabled owners out there who's listening or even professionals, please know that there are people who are very, very angry about the way that we get spoken about. And it is absolutely disgusting and appalling. And I'm going to keep being loud on this matter because for the people who think it's funny to bully us or don't care to ask us because clearly we don't have a voice, we have to train two different ways. Our dogs have to learn how to work with somebody who is able-bodied. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have to have a wheelchair or any mobility aids, great, good for you. But for disabled people, we have to train our dogs much harder than you and we have to train them with a wheelchair as well. So my dogs have best of both worlds. They have me before I was disabled in a wheelchair and now they have me in a wheelchair. And they can do things with a able-bodied person and they can do it with a disabled person. So we dual train. So yeah. for any disabled owners out there, we are better by a long stretch immediately because we have to dual train. Mm. So for anybody, if you've had this said to you, because I know there's lots of people out there who may have had it said to them, if anybody has made you feel like a crap dog owner or that you don't deserve to have a dog because of your disability, then just remember this, that we are better because we dual train. And we also go above and beyond for not just our dogs, but any animals as well. And, you know, just the way that, because society doesn't accept us and we have to bend to them, which obviously, like you know about as well, Laura's mental health, we're not accepted by society because we're not neurotypical. Yeah. <laughs> We have to adapt to them. So we've got frigging superpowers, people. So the <laughs> next time some ableist idiot says something derogatory to you, remember you have superpowers and they are prophetic and they are jealous. So please remember that because for people with disabled, uh, people with disabilities and mental health problems, or whether you've got, you know, schizophrenia if you're autistic bipolar whatever you matter and you work so hard every day that neurotypicals take for granted and you're gonna have like such a huge moral compass as well so please don't let anybody extinguish that or take that away from you because i think that that message needs putting out there all of the time and if people don't accept you for who you are stuff them literally stuff them press the block button and I know it's hard because I've been there, but you can do it and you'll feel so much better. And if you're only left with several friends, so what? Because it's better that than having a load of fake people who are saying anti-disabled or anti-mental health stuff. And you're seeing that all the time because it wears you down. And if you can't take care of yourself first, you are going to feel like crap. And then it is going to affect your relationship with your dog because you're going to be feeling guilty. So going back to the puppy blues, because I didn't explain it to begin with, but the, the puppy blues is literally when you feel anxious, guilty, overwhelmed, or you think you've made a mistake by getting a puppy. And it is completely normal. And just because GPs don't recognise it because it's not in their green book doesn't mean that it isn't a recognised term because it is recognised by therapists. So just remember when you go to your GP and you're saying about feeling down and depressed or whatever other symptoms that you've got of low mood, your GP does not know it all. Just remember they're a GP. You need to look to a therapist and if you can look to private therapy or maybe some of the talking apps, so there's like shout, you can try and see if there's somebody you can speak to who has a dog who's going to get it. I was very lucky with my private therapist because she did get it and I went through the puppy blues really, really bad. Um, 
and she did get it and that was tremendous support but your gp won't get it because they don't get it and then people's <laughs> skills suck <laughs> but the puppy blues is real so for anyone who says get over it it's just a puppy or rehome the puppy because like there are common responses that you'll get from people who just don't get it puppy blues is very much like postpartum depression but with a puppy because you're sleep deprived suddenly you're responsible for this little life and this little life wants your attention all of the time but it feels like that but it's not actually true because they need to sleep for 18 to 20 hours a day so even if they sleep through the night which is fantastic you're so lucky and i envy you because i didn't get that <laughs> they need to sleep quite a lot through the day as well so you can set them up with like doggy enrichment areas like an x pen or you can dedicate an entire room to a doggy enrichment land and uh the best thing to do is just get a do no harm dog training and baby and book by Linda Michaels MA because it explains it all in there. And also she's number one on Amazon right now. Yeah, exactly. She's beat <laughs> a certain trainer. <laughs> yeah. So if you get the handbook, it's gonna help you not just with doggy enrichment lands, but from having a puppy, or even before you get a puppy, having a puppy into adolescence, into adulthood, and for rescue dogs as well. So it's a really, really very good, and it's a literal handbook to have by your side when you're feeling overwhelmed because not everybody can afford dog training and behavior modification. That's just a fact. It doesn't make you a crap owner. It doesn't, despite what people say and despite market employees, which is a bit crappy, to say that you're a crap dog owner if you can't afford it. Some people just can't afford it. But if you can get somebody to gift you the book just because or it's a birthday, or Christmas, mm. and that will help you quite a lot, and then obviously there's lots of groups that you can come to, where you're safe, you're not going to be patronised, you know, and it's really important to, to build a support network when you're going through the puppy blues, with people who get it, so if you come to the Do No Harm uh, dog training group, you will get support there, you know, and you're not going to be patronised, and people will quite happily share their stories, I see it all the time, but the puppy blues is real and it's not to be discounted. So even if a member of the family doesn't understand it, it doesn't mean it's not real. It just means that they don't understand it. But the puppy blues is real and it is recognised and they are pushing for it to be recognised by GPs as an actual depressive disorder because the puppy blues can last well into adolescence. And we all know the larger the breed, the longer their adolescence goes on for. Do you feel, Tasha, that because obviously like puppy blues is a term and we all recognise it, but I've often found that some people might not suffer from puppy blues, but they might suffer some sort of depression when it comes to the adolescence of the dog or maybe the dog going through a fear phase like reactivity or something like that, which can be really hard to deal with. And I don't feel like there's enough recognition on that. Either. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I extend the puppy blues well into adolescence and beyond because oh. obviously with adolescence, it's a very tough time for every single dog owner out there. Um, like So my puppy blues began with Coda as a puppy and then with Django, no puppy blues because he was the perfect puppy. He was literally wonderful. Six months hit and it was like, who are you? <laughs> Where's my baby gone? And he was awful for like a year. Awful. He went from doing everything. Um, so we did trick training straight away. And he was really young when he was getting all of his trick titles. Like he was literally 10 weeks old onwards getting his trick titles to six months old. And he was literally giving me the finger. <laughs> Anything I was asking him to do. Um, and that was a shock because I was prepared for the puppy blues with Django because obviously going through it with Coda. And then Django is like a breath of fresh air and I love you and you're awesome and everything you do, you you just can't be perfect enough. Love me into this false sense of security. And then, <laughs> bang, hello, I'm here to ruin your life. <laughs> and I think that's what happens to a lot of people because they have amazing puppies and these puppies that won't leave their side, they're really good when they're out and about. And then all of a sudden, adolescence hits. 
and they they just don't know what to do yeah Dog owners are just like what's happening you know and i i don't think the the adolescence phase gets talked enough about in dog ownership absolutely absolutely um, yeah they're worn down a lot aren't they owners when adolescent hits and then mm. that's when we tend to see frustration and then we see i apologize now i hit my dog I know I shouldn't have done and this is in four three groups but mm. they're being transparent about it so hats off to you for being transparent not for hitting your dog um but it is frightening when you've been doing so well and then suddenly you're not doing well and they are literally slamming the door in your face metaphorically but literally mm. it is a big shift and it is overwhelming because um yeah, if you've got a puppy who's doing everything for you and being awesome, be prepared because that puppy is going to be a monster when they turn six months old, <laughs> literally. Um, <clears throat> but you need to stick with it. And the other thing you need to do is not focus on social media. Yeah. Because there's the worst thing, when you've got an adolescent dog, the worst thing you can do is look at social media about how wonderful everyone else's lives are with their dogs and they're doing all of this stuff. Remember, 0 0.03 seconds is a lie. And it's not fair. And it is upsetting because you're dealing with all of this stuff that you don't know how to deal with. And you feel embarrassed because the general public are morons and they make clever comments and you feel even more isolated. And then your friends are saying how wonderful their dogs are. And it could be your first dog. It could be you've had dogs dogs all your lives and you've forgotten what it's like to have a puppy because the amount of owners I've worked with that have said I've never had a dog like this before yes yeah. you have you just don't remember what it was like 13 yeah. years ago don't. <laughs> <laughs> and they generally don't they forget how awful and traumatizing it can be but what we've got to remember is that they're suffering just as much as we are because they're teething their hormones are coming through um they're having growing pains suddenly in the environment is really scary and because of the hormones patches of your eye that didn't affect them before suddenly does and they don't understand and then other dogs are starting to bark and growl at them and they don't understand why and it's because of that hormones so you've got to remember that they're having a really really hard time too so they are struggling which is then in turn why you're struggling but how you handle it is a different story so get as much support as you can and even if you ditch training for six months like literally just ditch it you don't need mm. to do it so forget about loose lead forget mm. about doing obedience because we're doing away with obedience anyway especially like in the holistic area i don't do obedience can't stand it never have um, even my first classes, it was we don't do obedience, it's dog training skills because obedience is for kennel club and we're not about that. Um, because again, my experience is working with owners who are the minority, who don't want to do um, obedience, they don't want to go to crofts, they don't want to do dog shows and they don't want to do dog sport competitions. Like I said, they are my people. I worked with them specifically because they are my people and I feel comfortable around these people i do not feel comfortable around people who do other stuff and egos so yeah that was my preference and i was bullied for it by local dog trainers and i had fake reviews put up which was pathetic um and it shows more about their character than it does mine because you're so threatened by me um and yeah just do do with it like do dog training games instead of going to my youtube tons and tons of tutorials on there make everything a game because the problem is that we're shifting so us millennials yes hello which a lot of us are changing the way that things seem like so we're focused on holistic dog training and empowering our dogs making our dogs lives better through collaborative care and doing dog training skills through games and focusing on their needs rather than training itself I know mm. for a lot of people who've had parents who drilled in obedience to them and rubbing dogs' noses in the carpets if they've had an accident and all that jazz, it takes time for you to adapt and then say, hey, no, I'm not doing this because it's 
wrong and it's hurting my dog and it takes a lot and david mech who i think is an awesome awesome uh person in the dog training industry um he said it takes 20 years for people to start accepting a uh, new research or a new term wow. and i'm like yeah actually that fits in wow. really well because if you like look now the amount of people who like the person that linda knocked off the number one spot mm -hmm. th that literally marries up to 20 years ago and now people are shifting in that he has a lot less followers than he used to back then obviously social media wasn't prevalent like it was back then but loads of people admit to they used to watch it 20 years ago and now they don't anymore um and a lot of people base their dog training mythologies as a professional on that guy yeah. and they've been transparent about it and they've been straight up and honest about about it as well um and it, it's just really important that you focus on you so if you don't feel like you can go to an in-person dog training class don't loads of us are doing it online now because it's better for dog welfare um you don't have to leave the house you don't have to deal with traffic so there's no car chasing you don't have to deal with the dogs. You don't have to deal with people making stupid comments or making you feel inadequate. You can stay in the comfort of your own home, the safety of your own home, and you can enjoy an hour with your dog doing dog training and nobody's going to judge you. Um, so I think that's really important for people to understand as well that doing training on Zoom or whatever platform is literally no different to doing it in person because like me and Laura sat here talking to each other now, is exactly the same, it's interactive. So you'll be given instructions, you'll be shown a tutorial, and then as you're doing it, because obviously you're on camera, then you're guided to whether you can improve on something slightly or how you're doing. And classes even happen outside, but in your local area where it's relevant to you. Because another thing that comes back is before COVID, people always say, the dog will do the behaviours at the village hall, but not out where they live. Mm. So they'd have to have one-to-ones as well because it was just so overwhelmed. Well, you don't have to do that with online classes because you can literally do the class out on your walk, you know, do, like practice the behaviours and stuff. And I think that isn't talked about enough or empowers people enough. So if you are having a hard time with an adolescent dog, you can learn all the skills that you need through the virtual classes practice it on a walk and you know that you've got your dog trainer behaviors there to help you to guide you and to comfort you and then when it comes to doing your homework you're going to feel a lot more confident and empowered um and it's better for the dogs because they don't have to travel they don't have to go anywhere they don't have to be surrounded by dogs and they don't have to be worried um so it, it's better all around for everybody literally and not just saying that just because i do virtual classes but covid really made made me think about my moral compass and i wasn't okay with doing in-person stuff anymore because to mm. me it was too much for the dogs and at the end of the day it's the owners who need to learn who to do this stuff with their dogs not me and again people would see me doing stuff with their dogs and then feel deflated because the dog's not doing it with them doing it virtually yeah. empowers the dog owner straight away and that's what dog training and behavior modification should be about is empowering the dog and then dogs go into a village hall and it's too much for the dogs and you start to see reactions and stuff and it's like no this doesn't fit my moral compass anymore zoom is so much better and dog owners are happier they feel empowered they're seeing changes straight away through their own handling skills not me i'm out of the equation now <laughs> <laughs> um and i think that's really important and you don't have to go to in-person classes you don't there is no law saying that you have to um and you don't have to work with dog trainers and behaviors that you don't gel with if you have mm. a one-to-one -one and you don't feel comfortable i give you permission you don't have to keep working with them because it's really important for us to gel with who we're working with. And there needs to be um, a symbiosis and a relationship there for it to work. Because if you don't like us, you're not going to absorb anything that we're saying anyway. Mm. And I think that's really important for people to understand, especially with adolescent dogs, 
Yeah. Because uh, I've been sworn at and all sorts over the years because <laughs> of adolescence dogs. And I've had tears and my people storm off. Then I've had apologetic text messages and phone calls and crying and grabbing me in the supermarket and bursting into tears. Honestly, there is nothing that I have not seen due to adolescent dogs. Um, and I do think people need to talk about it a lot more and, again, be transparent about it because, again, it's something that nobody wants to talk about. Yeah. Um, or you'll see something on a personal Facebook and on a business page, you'll see something completely different. And you're just like, why not be transparent to make that connection with your clients? So they're like, hey, you're human too. Um, because the bullying that you see for dog trainers that have reactive dogs, I think that's pathetic. I, that I hate it. And it really, yeah, that, that really gets to me as well. Like with reactive dog owners, like they're always pushed out of of everything and on local groups you see it as well where like someone's posted something and they say look my dog's on a lead has a muzzle on has signage on everywhere but an off-lead dog has run up to mine please don't do this and then all these people comment and say well your dog shouldn't be out then they you know they're not friendly and all this kind of stuff and I really feel for those people because it must be hard having to go through that every day absolutely absolutely and it is wrong that people with reactive dogs are excluded um like one client sticks out for me particularly like years and years ago um she said I never had a reactive dog before and now I do I feel so guilty for some of the terrible things that I used to say mm. and I said you know what I'm sure loads of people be comforted to hear that because she said, like, it's nothing she did. She had him from a puppy. Um, he hadn't been attacked by other dogs, but he was just reactive. And the thing is, when you have a reactive dog, you can't predict why, or you can't predict when you get a puppy, you're going to have a reactive dog. And why should there be any shame in it? Um, mm. Because, again, like with the holistic movement, we're ditching the word reactive. It's an expression of an emotion. Because it is an expression of an emotion. Reactive is just, again, one of these easy words that got tossed out without much meaning or understanding behind it. Um, but then the media, again, say, oh, it's down to the owners. The owners haven't trained them, and that's why. And then that's all over social media all the time. Yeah. I quite happily call that journalist all the time. Oh, they do my head in, like, especially, at, yeah, because obviously there's been like recent dog attacks at the moment and everyone wants to put their you know oh everyone's a legal expert now yeah <laughs> um but yeah journalists are the worst for it please don't listen to anything that a journalist says if you go onto any newspaper and a journalist has said it just go on to something else because it's going to be wrong because they aren't dog trainers or behaviorists we also can't verify the credentials of the pe people that they've spoken to. I looked at a couple in London and I was horrified. I was like, so where's qualifications? Mm. Um, and they even said that one was a self-proclaimed something or other. So please don't listen to anything that newspapers say or even the news and BBC. Mm. Um, quite a few of us last year had a run-in with the BBC and got really nasty responses because we spoke about a certain trainer that they was advertising um so the bbc you are responsible probably mm -hmm. for that lady with the french bulldog and many other people who flocked to this person because you arrogantly and stupidly boosted this person up and literally advertised them and then when we told you what you was doing and that the way that this person works and the damage that he does, you said it was none of our business and he didn't use the tools when he was filming. Well, whoop do chuffing do? <laughs> you feel stupid now, though. <laughs> oh, spicy yeah. tonight. And um, I, I wrote down earlier as well that, like, some things that I do to help with my own mental health while I'm training, um, even though I, I will admit that Luna isn't, you know, the hardest of dogs. Um, so I don't know whether you have anything else to share as well, Tasha. Um, 
is that I don't train when I'm not feeling good. Like if I'm not in a good positive mental state, I don't train because it always goes wrong. <laughs> and she yeah, knows straight away. Um, and I sometimes like if we're out on a walk or anything like that, um, I try to train at more natural times where like there's natural occurrences that will just happen. Like I always have treats on me so I can train in that way. Or well, some days we're out and then she'll, I don't know, like jump on a bench or something and look at me as if to say, come on, let's see some training. And I'm like, all right then. Um, yeah, and I try to do it more that way because otherwise if I, otherwise I just feel like I set myself up to fail sometimes. Um, and something... Um, it doesn't happen very often, but I must admit it has happened and I'm not proud of myself, is that if I feel like I'm becoming really, really stressed in front of a dog, whether it be Luna or with one of the rescues I work with, um, I remove myself from the situation and go and hide in the toilet for five minutes, take a breath um, and then go back again and start again. And I think that's the same for good parents as well with children. I think that's the same as what they would do, you know, if they're like feeling like the children are getting on their last nerve. Yeah. The best thing to do is just remove yourself from the situation because otherwise you're just going to explode and then go back to it. Yeah. And then you avoid the situations where you, you know, you shout at your dog or. Yeah do other things yeah no I totally agree I totally agree and I've said that to clients over the years before as well like uh definitely like I said take yourself out of the situation go and calm down um mm. I you know I've had to take dog leads off people before in the past because I've said like you need a time out you need to go and calm down um but no I totally agree with everything that you've said because that's really really helpful to the situations that people find themselves in um and like you said capturing behaviors instead is the much better way to go because when you're capturing behaviors you're not setting yourself up to fail you're not setting the dog up to fail and the dog can't do anything wrong because there's no expectations um and i think people need to start evaluating that as well as they need to start thinking about their expectations what is it that you're expecting the dog to do and how are you going to communicate that effectively to your dog because if you if you've got a dog to enjoy them and just enjoy them, just do that. Just enjoy them. As long as you're responsible and keep your dog on a lead, and then practice recall in enclosed fields and use a long line, and that kind of thing, you're doing everything right. And nobody's got you know a right to say anything else. And as for loose lead walking, we we're ditching that because we're all about sniffer faris these days. Um, so if someone makes a clever comment about your dog walking to heel or your dog needs to walk like this, who are they? What credentials do they have? Like the guy on the TV with no credentials, yeah. but causes massive harm. Um, and that's what you need to start thinking about, is about what's going to affect you um, and what it is that you want from your relationship with your dog because that's more important. And then when you go home, you're not going to be a massive ball of stress and you're not going to be wondering what other people are thinking because when other people make horrible comments, they've forgotten about it and then they're watching the likes of Jeremy Kyle because that's the type of person that they are, toxic. Um, whereas it's you that's left with it. Like you said, Laura, when you're still chewing on something for years and years and years, it's true because that is the epitome of anxiety, isn't it? It, you chew on something for years and years and years and you probably never get closure with it yeah. whereas this person they forgot about it as soon as they said it they just thought it was being funny or whatever um or they was trying to get attention or feed their ego and being pathetic that's what you've got to start doing as well is putting negative labels on these people and it's okay it's okay to negatively label people because on social media with um self-empowerment posts and all these counseling and coach pages and stuff and they all say the same thing you need to cut toxic people out of your life and it's okay to set boundaries 
And, it, you know, you do have permission to do that. You are allowed to set boundaries and you're allowed to say no. I've got to practice it. I've got loads of homework to do <laughs> for my anxiety and stuff. But you do, you do need to set boundaries and you do need to start quitting toxic people out of your life. I've unfriended loads of people in the last week because they're toxic and I don't need them. And I don't want to see that horrible post tearing other people down anymore. Mm. I'm sick of seeing it. And I don't think they're big and I don't think they're clever. I literally think they're trash. So I literally put them in the trash because it is awful. And again, a lot of them have been professionals that I've had to eradicate from my friends list because they are slagging people off that are paying them. And I don't think it's right. Yeah. Um, not to say that they all do that by any means. This is like a drop in the river, literally. It, it generally it isn't a lot of people. It just sounds a lot because it's a lot to me because I'm one of these people that try to think the best of others. And when I see these behaviours, it shocked me to my core. But so it isn't all of them. So please don't think that all trainers and behaviours like this because they're genuinely not. But it's just a few of them. And like I said, they've been eradicated from my friends list at least um because you don't need to see that so if you see someone being toxic you can delete them if you see somebody who you think doesn't treat their dog very nicely you can delete it and if someone says to you that you need to do x with your dog because you're force free or you're trying to be holistic delete them because nobody has their opinion mm -hmm. um and it's the same thing with the snobbery as well. Like I had someone about five, four or five years ago now giving me hell all the time because I had no aspirations to be on Crufts or have anything to do with Crufts or Kennel Club or do heel work to music or any of that rubbish or do competition dog sports. And I was like, so how can you call yourself a trainer or behaviorist? Uh, because I'm qualified and for the kind of training and behavior I do, you need qualifications, whereas all that stuff, you don't need any qualifications. That's the difference. So just because somebody's got confidence, wants to do that stuff with their dog, great. But you don't get to compare and then slag them all over Facebook um, in local groups that they're a crap dog trainer because they have academic qualifications because that's just pathetic. But yeah, that one person that damaged me for a long time, really not my confidence. Um, and it literally took me years to pick myself back up. I'm like, no, screw you. What do you know? You know absolutely nothing. Um, and now they're trying to have a pop at dog training themselves, which I think is absolutely hilarious because I've got no empathy, no sensitivities. And they clearly think that doing all that stuff qualifies you as a dog trainer, not actually understanding dogs or dog behavior or reactivity, adolescence and all the rest of it. You know, there's so much that goes into it, like especially for people like me, and there's other people like me, we can't go beyond being a dog trainer behaviorist because it's exhausting, because we get compassion fatigue and we soak up all of the negative stuff that we hear all the time. So when we hear that a dog has been hit or we hear that dogs being abused or we hear not very nice things are going on behind closed doors, it's exhausting. And it's mentally draining and emotionally draining and it takes its toll, whether you've got mental health problems or not. So going back around to the mental health problems bit, when, you, when you're a professional or whether you're a dog owner and you've got mental health problems and you're hearing this stuff, you do take it to heart and you do carry it with you because that's the nature of having mental health problems. Um, yeah, of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah that's the nature of having mental health problems because you know your brain isn't like everybody else's so there's no shame in that and you don't need to be ashamed for having mental health problems and you don't need to feel ashamed because your relationship with your dog looks different to others because if your dog's having fun and they're well cared for and they're well looked after and they have a great life and you're meeting all of their needs and beyond, then that, that's all that matters. Um, yeah, just ridiculous. I mean, what do you think, Natalie? I think it's, it's not nice. And I think since COVID, I think it's got worse. So much um, worse. 
think people have got a bit meaner since COVID because they're just hiding behind the screen a little bit more and they're just not thinking before they're speaking. Um, so COVID hasn't really helped with the with matters, I don't think, at all. I don't, I don't think stuff like TikTok either has helped. No. No, because everyone thinks we're an expert on TikTok and everyone thinks they can be as vile as possible, hidden under a fake username. Yeah. Um, and obviously there's no transparency like Facebook where there's a profile picture and a profile who explains who this person is. It could mm. be anybody. And they're getting their rocks off destroying people. Like I said earlier with the disabled comments and stuff, quite a lot of that has been on TikTok as well, saying like disa pregnant disabled women need to abort their babies. Oh, that's sick. Mm. And you never get away with saying something like that on Facebook because you get thrown off Facebook for saying something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not good it's not a good it can be quite it's quite toxic ah. um but i think yeah there's, there's a lot of people that probably don't post anything because they're worried about what people are going to say or what backlash it's going to have and it is sad absolutely i mean i didn't post my video in this group after that disabled comment was made because i'm disabled and then somebody else piped up with yeah, well, um, we can't really talk on disabled people because there's no disabled people in this group. Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to hear my voice. You're not interested mm -hmm. in what I've got to say. And it, you know, as soon as I did give my advice, no one responded to it anyway. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not good. People just don't think before they speak or what implications it might have. No. No, we're just talking about how toxic TikTok is as well. Oh, don't get me started. Like, I I hardly ever go on there. And then I went on there the other day. And sorry that this has nothing to do with dog training. But um, the first thing that came up, I don't know why it came up for my algorithm, um, was this popular um, TikTok filter that's going around. And everyone's been posting about it. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. <laughs> And it basically, it's this filter, and then you look at yourself and press the filter, and it makes you look, like, amazing and, like, some top model or something. Yeah. Uh, I was looking at I was like, I don't look like that, you know? And I just thought, how bad is that that, you know, people are going to look at that, and then it's going to make them feel awful when they turn the filter off and realise that they actually don't look like that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll send it to you. You love it. <laughs> okay. But again, that's bad for mental health, isn't it? Because it's TikTok, so, again, is... It's so bad for mental health. Yeah. TikTok's one of the worst because, again, you've got loads of people on there think they're experts when they're, like, 13-year-old children. That's the first thing. Or probably younger. Um, then you've got loads of people with massive egos on there who think they're experts, doling out dog training advice and all the rest of it. And TikTok doesn't care if someone's using a prong or an e-collar on their platform. They don't care if animals are being abused on TikTok. Like, it's literally ridiculous. The only reason I use it is for the text-to-speech, um, mm. so that both deaf and visually impaired people can use my videos, so it's all inclusive. Um, because, again, a marginalised community that gets left out quite a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I do believe that TikTok does a lot of harm and I think it's really toxic and I think it's a space to breed toxic behaviour. Um, and when you see these young people who are doing these toxic things, saying these toxic things, and then you see in the news of the toxic things of the generation under the millennials, it's sickening. It really is. And you think, wow, on one day, these guys may be in the House of Commons that's terrifying yeah. absolutely terrifying um because we don't want those type of people that they're the type of people that we're trying to stop um and again for your mental health if you know you are struggling whether you've got depression or you just got depression at the time and it's passing or whatever take breaks from social media there is absolutely nothing wrong with taking breaks from social media i regularly do it and there are lots of other people that regularly do it, and it's becoming a normal behaviour because 
Um, it wasn't until I literally started dog training when I had social media. Didn't have it before that. And it is so toxic. Um, but yeah, you give yourself permission to literally have a break from social media. And I guarantee you'll feel better because you're not seeing anybody else. There's no false expectations. Um, because you'll be nicely surprised, actually. Like when you do see this stuff and you're trying to train it because they've put up this stuff and it's actually not real. When you are actually doing it, well bloody done. Because, you know, the chances are you've seen something really heavily edited, but you've worked really hard to get there. And I don't think that is emphasised on enough as well because of the lack of transparency um, and where people think that things are genuine or that they're real or that it's the raw version, not a cleverly edited version because people have too much power to edit things now. Um, so people aren't getting the real picture anymore and that's damaging to mental health. But take take social media breaks. You're allowed to. Um, mm. And the same for dog professionals as well. You're allowed to take social media breaks. You are allowed. You have permission. Um, obviously, just like deal with your messages or whatever instead, because obviously you can't post to your page that you're taking a social media break for your mental health. But you can just limit it to just going in, answering messages and coming back out again because you don't need the toxic behaviours on there um, because dog professionals and owners equally you know, need looking after because all dog trainers and professionals are dog owners anyway. And that's mm. what we've got to remember in, in, is to foster this place where people feel they can come forward and say, you know what, I'm really struggling because as dog professionals with the dog industry being unregulated, we don't have people we can turn to. There's no HR. There's no lovely silent room with little cave pods and ear defenders like Google and all that jazz. Um, we're literally out on our own having chunks torn out of us most days um, for whatever reason. And it needs to start becoming the norm where we reach out to somebody and we say, look, I'm really struggling right now. Can you help me? Um, because with Dr. Sophia Yin, because I feel like she's been forgotten about, even though she only passed in 2014, um, by doing the same thing as the lady from the Be Kind movement. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And the reasons for her doing it was compassion fatigue as well. She was exhausted. She couldn't deal with it no more. And we lost such a kind and amazing mind because she couldn't take it anymore. And if we'd adapted this, like, not a society, but industry where it's like, it's okay to talk and say you're struggling and the compassion fatigue is rising, you know, then maybe she would have felt differently about what she did. Um, but I know I've been there as well. Um, I don't know if you want to share anything, Laura, but, you know, th this is the thing, like, dog professionals do have to have mental health support, whether it's uh, community support, the GP, hospital, you know, therapy, ongoing therapy long term. But I know I'm not the only dog professional out there that has also tried to go down the same route as Dr. Sophia Yitten. Um, yeah. I'm not going to be the only one. <laughs> No, no, I'm I'm with you. I I'm I'm there too. Be <laughs> there as well. See, I knew I wasn't alone. Well, there's going to be quite a lot of us, whether we talk about it or not. I know I certainly. People, I I don't think people want to admit it. It's quite shameful. And I know when I first did anything like that, I was in my teenage years, and after I failed to do the deed, um, I carried a lot of guilt with me afterwards. So I closed up about it and I think that's what people do kind of kind of find it embarrassing you know but again we only feel that way because of other people's perceptions and because mm. of the blanket perception so instead of what's going on to make you feel this way why do you feel so lost and disconnected that you mm. can't reach out for help no you're selfish you're a horrible person what yeah, about all the people you're leaving behind but that gets to me because it's yeah. like when people say oh you're selfish because you're not thinking about the people you're leaving behind or the effect it will have on them that gets to me because 
when you're in that state of mind no you're not thinking about anyone else like you you just aren't because you're not well and that's completely valid absolutely Um, and I think it is just a case of um you know I have a lot of techniques that I use now to stop myself from feeling like that because I notice the signs um I don't know whether do you have anything Tasha that like you feel you do to stop yourself from feeling compassion fatigue and stop yourself from getting to that burnout level um like I I said to you and when you did your original webinar we was talking afterwards wasn't we and I shocked you to the core and I said like mental health problems my whole identity (laughs) Mm. I wasn't kidding um Mm. But I do all sorts to help myself. So I've got um, an app on my phone called Finch, which you can download mm-hmm. and you can either do the free version or pay for it. Obviously, if you pay for it, the same as any app, you get to do more things with it. But you're literally given a baby penguin to take care of, much like a Tamagotchi, except less interactive. Um, so you have to love it, give it energy, feed it or give it a drink. Um and the other thing that you have to do if you want to like work through the app, you've got all these challenges every day and you can even set your own challenges as well. So it will say things like get up and make your bed and then you have to tick it off and you get seven points for that. Yeah. Drink water. You get seven points for that when you tick it off, get a shower, put a warm towel on your shoulders. like, And it gives you all these self-care things to do that you wouldn't normally do when you're in a negative state of mind and you get seven points. So when you get to like 40 points, your penguin could go on an adventure. So he can go for a walk through the forest and like make friends and then that expands his personality and sociability and that kind of thing. And it may seem silly to some people listening to it right now, but unless you've used it, you don't know how helpful it can actually be. So I just referred it on to two friends lately and one of them's fed back that they're doing so much better in this space of like four weeks because of using the Finch app. Mm. Um, and it's actually making them do things, go out for a walk and that kind of thing. So first of all, it's the Finch app. And there is loads more to it, but I'll be all day trying to explain everything to it. So you can get the Finch app. You can download it on Google or iPhones. Um, so that's the first thing you can do. Journaling. Nobody likes journaling because you've got to be honest and you've got to dig out all those feelings. But it can be helpful and it can be empowering to journal. Um, Because I'm banging on about journals for dogs all the time. But also, like, for yourself, mental health-wise, journaling, that can help as well. Or even if you just write a letter to the person who's hurt or upset you, Mm. even if it is the turd on your dog walk who made you feel like crap, you can write letters to them and you can either keep it in a box, but the idea is that it's Pandora's box. You never open the box or you can just burn the letter. So you, but because the, the act of burning the letter is supposed to be that it lets go of all of the feelings. I've got tons of sensory fidget toys. So depending on like my mood and whatever, or how I'm feeling, I've got different things that I can play with and then I rotate them because I've got like a whole box of them um so you've got fidget toys as well cuddling the dogs my dogs are super cuddly so that really really helps to ground me and pull me out of it um scrapbooking as well I'm enjoying scrapbooking obviously you guys know that I love drawing and doing art as well um making things out of clay and that's your thing with art as well it doesn't have to be good if you just want to get a paintbrush and uh, those kids paints from like Tesco's or whatever and you want to get a sheet of paper and just get all your feelings out in colour do it, you never know it might look amazing once you've done it or you might feel a connection to it because you did that and you made something that you were then proud of by getting your feelings out Um, what else you're very creative like I've always noticed that about you you're very um you like like doing those little things like I don't know painting little boxes or 
doing drawings, um, gardening and stuff like that. And all of those things for me, I've always wanted to do, but I've never felt like they help me because I get quite frustrated when I'm doing them because I don't feel like I'm doing them to perfection when I'm doing it. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've mm. all got to start somewhere. So like when I started out, they looked terrible. And now like they are looking like how I want to do it. And I even draw things before I do it, like make it out of clay or like my plant pots and stuff. And the best thing about it is this, you can't interact with this. You don't know what's going on with it. So if you've left it alone for five hours and come back to a load of notifications, no one's got a gun to your head saying you have to open all those notifications now. You can go back to your creative bit and you find that the creative stuff is more addictive. Even if mm. you paint flower pots, like because I know loads of people on a budget and they think that art's really expensive, but it doesn't have to be. Um, you can even even like to begin like working with your fingers and stuff, you can get um air foam clay uh from the works. It's like one ninety nine for a bag of it, and it's for kids. Well, loads of adults use it, so you've got all the colors colors ready made. You make whatever animal you want, like you can copy the bag if you wanted to as a template. Um. And then you've made like a little mouse or something. That is something to be proud of. Because again, the arts world can be toxic as well. So it's making sure that you are proud of what you're doing. Don't diminish it. Um, because it's really, really important that you feel better. Um, but doing something creative, doing something physical, being away from social media, your phone, anything toxic, it makes you feel so much better. And then you'll find that because you are technically grounding yourself, your dog will also be very chilled and calm as well because they're picking up on your energy. So, yes, it may be woo-woo, but it's generally not. Like, my dogs are always super chilled while I'm doing stuff. Um, mm. And they enjoy when I do stuff because it's just that quiet time and just enjoying each other's company and your presence with each other. Um I do get self-help kits as well. Uh, so Tea Kind on Etsy, love their stuff. So it is pricey, but then you've got to think like 25 quid, you are getting 25 pounds plus worth of products. Um, so in there, you'll get like an ice pack. So like autistic people, they find sensory stuff really helpful. Um, you get a metal ring. So then you can play it across your fingers and it hurts. And obviously that's for a certain behaviour that some people do, but it's obviously not causing any pain. You get a big wad of crisis cards. You get a big wad of communication cards. So your crisis cards, they start with self-help stuff. So um, I'm feeling panicky and I'll say, count three things in the room quick. And then say the names of the objects out loud. So grounding techniques like that really help. And any communication cards, you can literally hold your card up to somebody and say, go away, I need space, just like your dog. So like your dog lead, you can do that for you in your own home too, or take it out and you walk. And you've literally got all these communication cards on a ring where if you are feeling nonverbal, you can literally hold up your communication cards, tell people to bugger off and leave you alone. Or if you need a hug and you don't want to say it out loud, you can hold up your card and say, I need a hug and it just takes that pressure away from it um mm. sour sweets they can help that's something that I do um because sour sweets ugh, it gets that reaction and it yeah. changes the reaction it yeah so just like a dog like you know how we do yeah. <laughs> exactly the engage and disengage game yeah but with sour sweets for humans and it works the same way um we keep doing all this stuff to our dogs. We need to do it to ourselves first, get ourselves in check. Um, but yeah, that's really helpful as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, if you've got an iPad, you can be creative straight away. Get the Procreate app. You don't need a fancy pen. Um, you can just get like the cheap 10 quid ones off Amazon that are compatible and just start drawing. And it doesn't have to look perfect. It doesn't have to look good. It's just about you being able to express yourself and get to the fact that if you wanted to digitally write loads and loads of swear words, then you can go ahead and do that as well. Um, 
But oh, and the other thing as well that most people find helpful who want to be creative but don't want to do like the frustrating bit of drawing is adult colouring books. Adult yeah. colouring books are awesome because you just literally got to colour it in and then you've got a nice picture you can frame at the end of it. But yeah, doing anything physical that takes you away from your phone and social media and pressures and even like your dog, if you are, you've got an adolescent dog and you're going to feel frustrated and you're going to get wound up, just go do something creative and then try to set a time every day for you where you're going to do like 30 minutes of self-care and you do something that's going to pull you out of feeling negative because I feel once you produce something, you're like, hey, I actually achieved something today. I did this. Mm -hmm. And there's no pressure on it. It's not for work. It's not for anybody else. It's just for you. And that feeling of achievement can start helping you to feel better, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, people just need to dabble around and then find what it is that suits them, what, what helps them. I think that's the thing as well, is finding what works for you. Because I think yeah a lot of the things you've suggested like like I said I'd really want to do but I know that I'd probably get frustrated in some way and I, I'm not sure where that comes from um so I have to do things that are more um I don't know like for example I I used to enjoy doing jigsaw puzzles but now I've stopped because I found that even whilst doing the jigsaw, my mind would still be ruminating. So wasn't really having that effect or like painting or something, as you say, I could still do that whilst being in my head at the same time. Um, so, yeah, I've recently, <laughs> it's going to sound really strange. Um, for anyone listening but yeah one thing I've recently found that's really helped me um because it I have to think so it keeps me away from the ruminative thoughts and it stops me from doing any harmful anything harmful is um my my bop it that, I, that I've had for years and I, I got it out especially <laughs> have you have you ever played one when I was a kid that looks really cool <laughs> But it actually helps because it's constantly saying to you, do this, do that, do that. You, you know, you, you're knocked out of that phase. Obviously, it's not relaxing. If you want to be relaxed, then no, it's not. It's not for that. But it's something that stops me from self-harming or anything like that. Because I, I, I haven't self-harmed in quite a few years now, um, which is quite unheard of for me um so yeah and um another thing that my therapists have said to me is about tip skills have you ever heard of tip skills so um one of them is um using um cold water um so some people will hold their nose and then dip their head into a bucket or sink of cold water. Um, but I don't like doing that because it makes me panic. Um, so I use like a Ziploc bag with ice cold water in it and then spread it all over my face. Um, and that this is this is more extreme for when I'm starting to dissociate or something like that. Um, and then I hold my breath and then it's, it's been known. It gives a, uh, it gives your brain the thought that you're actually diving underwater. So it's called the dive response. Um, and then your heart slows down, your blood flow um, is reduced and is restricted to the brain and heart so it actually regulates your emotions at that time so there's a lot of science behind it um for stopping those sort of things it sounds very strange and odd no, no, but no. and that feels yeah. really cool i've heard but, similar yeah. things with ice cold water or ice packs but not like mm. i didn't know it, was, it had a specific term 
yeah I think because you're holding your breath as well it's yeah I don't know it just kind of gets you out of it's not something I would do regularly it's just something I would do if I was in in an extreme state yeah yeah, absolutely yeah absolutely no that's completely valid yeah stuff I do regularly is more like um I like scents so I always sleep with lavender um and that kind of thing um watching certain things on tv that engage me yeah yeah that's it isn't it channeling your brain somewhere else so like I do loads of research so all these blogs aren't because it's uh how you know on purpose it's a happy accident so if I research science papers that grounds me and then that means that because I'm thinking like you'll bop it there's no time to be thinking about other things and also at the same time I get to educate people and I get to share like referenced research as well to help people um and I get to pull myself out of that moment as well so no it's totally valid um but yeah that's another side people don't see they just think I keep banging out all these blogs the more blogs that I bang (laughs) out there's a reason for it (laughs) and the more I'm struggling um but yeah and again it's like um with Sally isn't it but whenever you share a blog you're always panicking about the feedback that you're going to get on it yeah like that guy that we originally talked about (laughs) because the pressure comes with it as well it's like people who see it and then go oh well they've not responded so they obviously don't care and it's like I don't have the spoons right now to deal with it where I don't see a negative outcome so you can't do wrong for doing right (laughs) yeah that's the way I see it um just trying to think of other mental health methods but going for a walk gain exercise and fresh air that helps too. I know people are like, Ugh, but it does, it helps. Yeah, definitely. Uh, any form of exercise, if you go to your GP, they're always going to say about exercise and stuff like that. And I know that, you know, it's dependent on your abilities and everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's shown to work. I know that nutrition is often mentioned by gps but i can't say that i'm very good at following good nutrition oh, i don't think anyone is i think that comes back down to 0.03 <laughs> seconds of photo again um, i'm just like you know whenever like they ask you what's your diet like poor adequate yeah i'm just like no it's amazing you know? <laughs> even though no, myself i know that it's really poor but I know that the stress of changing my diet would cause me more anxiety. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that's the thing. Like the whole point of this podcast was like about self care and sharing experiences, so that other people don't feel alone. And with self care comes if you can't give up smoking, don't give up smoking. Yeah. If it's going to cause you more harm, don't do it. And if a GP is trying to tell you about eat healthier and you can't do it, and then you're going to be feeling overwhelming guilt whenever you eat something the GP doesn't approve of. Just remember that they're doing exactly the same. My auntie is a GP. They don't follow their own rules. So don't listen to them. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, but no, like if you're in a bad place, don't feel guilty about anything. Literally, just don't. Like if you want to eat junk food, go ahead and eat it. If you want to smoke, smoke um Mm. if you want to stay in bed all day stay in bed all day because um like there's another post that's coming up your dogs enjoy sleeping by you so even if you don't allow your dogs on the bed or they're too hot to be on the bed because we're entering into spring and summer now there's nothing wrong with staying in bed all day absolutely nothing Um, i think people get that guilt a lot is if you have a bad day and you need to stay in bed all day, then people do feel guilty because they're like, I'm not doing enough for my dog. Whereas we're probably both the same in that we know our dogs will be fine. They're quite happy (laughs) having a rest day. You know, I've learned to not feel guilty about it, but I can imagine that a lot of dog owners out there do feel guilty about that. Yeah. 
And the thing is, it, so if you've got a day off and you're staying in bed all day and that's you, where you choose to spend it, no problem. Because I can guarantee you now, if you was to record it, like some people have cameras in their rooms for some reason, if you're one of those people, you've got an away documenting it, it's a bit healthier than that. Um, if you document the amount of times that you fuss your dog, interact or cuddle with them, and then you look at a normal day where you're not staying in bed all day, and you're going to waste the day away on social media, I can guarantee it, and you're barely going to touch your dog. So mm. look at it this way, spin it around. If you're staying in bed all day, it's for a reason, because your body needs it, your mind needs it, and your dog also needs it. They need that cuddling and just being still with you. When people are running around all the time, there's heavy traffic in a house, and one of the dog's hyper because they're yeah. not getting the sleep that they need, which is negatively impacting them. So, of course, they're going to show behaviours that you don't particularly want because they're reflecting the energy of the house. You know, we can't ignore this, and it is science, whether people want to believe it or not. Energy does come under science, and it is proven physics you know um but yeah so when you create a mellow tone you're going to get mellow behaviors from your dog when everything's high and angsty you're going to get the same behavior from your dog because dogs do tend to mirror us because they're very clever like that um and then the other thing that people feel guilty just before we finish is um oh if i'm anxious i'm feeling that anxiety down the lead to my dog right so guilty, here's guilty, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> but here's something. Um, when I was gonna get diesel, I think I told you about this before. I was actually meant to get a shepherd and it was all awful. Then I decided I was gonna get diesel. I didn't want to have a dog. So I was a dog trainer, I was a kennel hand, and I was a decoy, and I didn't want a dog because I was scared that my anxiety would negatively impact the dog that I had. Mm. Yeah, no, he's fine. <laughs> he's friends with everyone. He's like eight years old now. He's perfect. Um, like everybody wants him because they think he's an amazing dog. And I have tons of things wrong with me. Like I said at the start of all my diagnoses, and it's just grew through the years along with me. Um, so that that that's no reason not to have a dog. So please don't feel guilty or ashamed because you've got anxiety. Because it's not true. Again, it's something that people say, much like disabled people shouldn't have dogs. It's mm. the same thing. Um, and with the anxiety being fed down the lead or whatever, no. So if you're an anxious person, your dog knows the baseline that you are an anxious person. And your dog's going to be more concerned about you because they may have witnessed you have panic attacks. They may be wondering what your breathing's doing. And yes, dogs may form associations that the dog that's barking and going at it and looking scary could be frightening you. But that by no way means that you're a bad dog owner or you shouldn't have a dog. Um, you can do breathing techniques as well. Um, and if you look at Janet Finley with Canine Confidence website, go to the Canine Confidence website. There's a free tea touch taster webinar. And there's mm. like several lessons in it. And she teaches you this uh, technique where you put your hand on your heart and you push down and you lift up and you go around in a circle. Don't ask me how it works. You'll have to listen to Janet speak. But it does work. So it's with somebody with crippling anxiety who has regular panic attacks. Things are having a heart attack because it's so bad. Janet's technique does help and I feel more grounded and more safe when I take my dogs out for a walk than mm. at any other time because I'm just happy watching them and it gives me a dopamine rush yeah. whereas all the other times I'm just like nah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I hope it's helped people and thank you for also sharing your very personal experiences Laura because I know it's a big deal um <laughs> Who knows, in 10 years' time, people might be like, oh, well, this is groundbreaking. They're really talking about mental health and <laughs> sharing their experiences. And it might be totally normalised in 10 years. We might be halfway there now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Let's hope. Um, <laughs> but if any owners or professionals want to reach out and they need to talk to people who get it and understand and they aren't going to judge you and bully you, 
then please feel free to reach out to us because that's what it's all about. Um, you know, you don't have to feel alone. And just because your dog's, you know, you might have a puppy or an adolescent dog or they might be reactive or you might not be where you want to be with them. Just love your dog for who they are because they love you for who you are, for all of your faults and all the rest of it. And just remember, you're not as awful as so many other people out there that do do awful things to their dogs on a regular basis. You know, just because they can or it's their ego or they just want to prove a point um, or they're looking for the quickest fix because that's just stupid. Um and yeah, then that starts to question dogs' welfare and suitability for owning that dog. Not mental health. There's nothing wrong with having mental health problems. Uh, what do you think, Laura? Um, yeah, I think that was a great chat. And I think, yeah, anyone who is struggling, like dog owner or dog professional, should just reach out. I don't mind anyone private messaging me um, to talk about it. Um, because I know that a lot of people were interested in the chat tonight, but um, haven't joined. So if they can't for whatever reason and they want to catch up and ask questions and everything, then I'm quite happy to answer. Awesome. But yeah, the main takeaway is just like, don't feel ashamed of being disabled or having mental health problems or being autistic or whatever label has been assigned to you by a GP or a specialist. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, and that doesn't affect your relationship with your dog either. It's other people that are the problem. Um, Natalie, have you got anything to say, dude? No, it was great. Thank you. <laughs> Just Yorkshire voice comes in. <laughs> <laughs> no, really good. I think it'll help, it'll help a lot of people and gives people some ideas and stuff they can do and maybe help people post a bit more. Awesome. Yeah, a bit more confidence that's the main thing isn't it yeah well well thank you very much for listening yeah next time well so obviously it's two weeks on friday and we have roman gottfried joining us from america roman is a holistic trainer and behavior consultant and he's awesome um and he's going to be speaking about holistic relationships and approaches for dog owners for so for any dog owners listening you definitely want to get in on this chat as well because roman will very much go into deeper energy fields than we have done tonight but be open-minded when listening to roman because he's definitely worth listening to and it's a completely different approach and again this follows on from mental health so it's been carefully orchestrated with the dates to kind of feed into it so that you're going to feel safe and you're going to feel okay. Um, so, yeah, definitely tune in. And the same goes for people with assistance dogs as well, because I know that's quite prevalent just before we finish. Um, because obviously, if you have an assistance dog, it's going to be prescribed by a GP or a specialist. You know, there is nothing wrong with your relationship. Your dog doesn't need retiring or anything like that based on social media naysayers. And people who just want to pull you down out of jealousy because there is jealousy out there, like having an assistance dog because they don't understand it and they think you're just taking your dog everywhere because you can, because of your medical problems or illnesses. Um, so ignore them and focus on what kind professionals have to say instead. And if you are struggling with training your dog because you're owner training, again, you can come to my YouTube channel, which is Maggie's Dog Training. Lincolnshire for lots of free tutorials and again you can reach out to me or Laura for help and we'll be more than happy to assist you so you don't need to give up because of some social media troll literally being a troll you and your dog are what matters and as long as you're both happy that's it that's all that matters so thank you very much Laura and thank you Natalie and then thank you. we shall be back in two weeks. Bye. Bye.